Well, as I mentioned, today is the uh, celebration of the 70th anniversary of the independence of Israel. It was recreated in a day. And joining me now to talk about the significance of this day and the fact that it is 70 years uh, of, uh, of, as a nation reborn is former Minnesota Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, former Republican presidential candidate as well. Michelle, so great uh, to be with you and thanks so much for joining us on this tour. Well, this is easy to do, to join you here at the Sea of Galilee with 200 of the greatest people you could ever travel with, ever. So we are having a great time with people all over the United, from all over the United States who love everything that FRC stands for, and we're going to have a great time together this week. Well, Michelle, you and I have been to Israel actually a few times uh, together and some very significant uh, occurrences. We've met with the Prime Minister when we've been here at some strategic moments of uh, negotiations. Uh, between the United States and uh, some of the surrounding countries. But today is quite a significant day to be here. Today is a very significant day. This is the 70th anniversary of a miracle. And that's what I think all of the listeners need to understand. This is miraculous. This is fulfillment of scripture. This is prophetic. And again, as Tony had said in the opening remarks, this has never happened before. But it isn't just a country that was reconstituted. It was God's prophetic word. And if I can, I just want to read a scripture. And this event that happened 70 years ago today was foretold in Jeremiah 31.10. Hear the word of the Lord, you nations. Proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. In fact, if you go from Genesis all through the Bible, you see the prophetic word of God. Israel being told, look, Israel, you have a choice. You can either choose to obey God, and there were 14 different blessings, or you can choose to disobey God, and there are 50 different judgments. The worst judgment was the scattering of his people. And as you said, 1900 years ago, his people were scattered all over the world in the greatest judgment. And this impossibility that we are witnesses of today shows the graciousness of God, the restoration, the redemptive nature of a holy God, but it also, as we heard from our pastor this morning in our Bible time on the shores of Caesarea, this is also the preparation. We're in a transition period for the second coming of Messiah, Jesus Christ. So just as we know for sure, he came a first time. And as we know, the scripture is fulfilled by Israel being returned to the land as a gracious God did. We too can know that what we will see this week as we go to the Mount of Olives and other sites together, we know for sure when he steps foot on the Mount of Olives, every jot and tittle of scripture will be fulfilled. Well, and I wouldn't mind if it happened while we were here. That would actually be kind of neat. Um, let's talk about it. One of the things that's been consistent over the 70 years of Israel's rebirth has been the really the, the conflict over the land. Uh, and that is ongoing where we, we see, uh, you know, in the previous administration wanting to push the borders back to the 1967 borders. What is so significant uh, about the land? And, and, and you mentioned uh, Pastor Dean Hahn, who's our, one of our teachers that are it's on our trip, and he had a message this morning. Uh, the the the, uh, the seed, uh, the soil. Uh, let's see what I mean. The seed, the soil, and the scripture. And I want to talk about. I want to get you to comment on the significance of the soil because that is one of the issues that's constantly being contested. 100% because we know that God in the Abrahamic covenant chose a person, Abram, Abram, Abraham, and he chose to bring him to a certain land here in the land of Israel. God was very prescriptive. He gave the exact boundaries of what this land would be. And again, like I quoted in Jeremiah and all throughout the Old Testament, he said this exact land is where they would come back. It's very interesting because no other land on earth was he going to lay out the whole prescription for mankind's ability to, to be redeemed back into God. And it was here where Messiah would be born. Because again, beginning with the seed, we have the Savior, but here on this land. 
it couldn't have happened anywhere else. It had to happen here, and it will happen here. And the reason why it's so important, because again, as we go to Jerusalem this week, when we go to the end of the book, Revelation 22, we know that a new heaven and a new earth will be formed and a new Jerusalem will come down. And so when we see Jerusalem, just think, you're home. You're home for those of you who know Jesus Christ. Only it'll be better than ever. It'll be a new Jerusalem. So not only is Israel our past, our present, but Israel and Jerusalem in particular for the believer, this is our future. You're listening to Washington Watch. I'm your host, Tony Perkins. So glad to have you uh, with us as we are broadcasting live from Israel. And uh, my guest, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, a voice that I'm sure listeners are familiar with. She's on the program quite frequently. And we have a, a, a group of uh, 200 friends and supporters that are traveling with us this week as we tour Israel. And uh, as I mentioned at the top of the program, today, the 70th anniversary of Israel's independence and we were able to uh, participate in some of those celebrations. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But I, I, Michelle, I want to continue on this for just a moment about the land because for evangelical Christians who are some of the strongest supporters of Israel, this is a clear-cut issue. The scripture is very clear about who this land belongs to. So it's, for us, this is really not a, uh, a negotiable this is something we believe belongs to the people of Israel. Well, that's right. God is a sovereign God, and he fulfills his word. So this land is, he said he would bring them back to this land. There is no indication in Scripture that they ever leave again. This is their land for all of eternity. And so we agree with Scripture. We agree with what God has promised for the Jewish people. And that's why, again, in Genesis 12, 3, the nations are told, and we're a part of the nations, we are those who bless Israel will be blessed, but also those who curse Israel will be cursed. And I think, Tony, you had mentioned that the United States was the first nation right. to recognize Israel. That was Harry Truman who did that in 1948. The United States has been singularly blessed uh, since that time. Remember, in the, in the early 1940s, we were not the economic and military superpower of the world. We were on a very high ascendancy toward that, but that actually belonged to Britain. The United Kingdom, or Britain at that time, was the economic and military superpower of the world. Today, the United States is, and I think in part, we are so blessed as a nation because we have been Israel's greatest friend, not a perfect friend, but their best friend. But now, I believe, with Donald Trump making the decision that he made to recognize Jerusalem. Well, and that's, I wanted to segue into that question, because how significant of a decision and announcement was that? It's been on the books for nearly a quarter of a century, but he is the first president to actually make that move. It's going to take place next month. How significant is that? It is vitally significant. In fact, I was telling people last evening that what the president did is he played the Trump card. No pun intended. He played the absolute ultimate card because the big game that's happened here in the Middle East, Israel's enemies have taken this tact in their warfare against Israel. Illegitimacy. They want to say Israel has no right to this land, no historic right, no biblical right, and that's why they deny that Jerusalem is the capital. When President Trump said unequivocally that Jerusalem is Israel's capital and we will build an embassy there, he took the main event off the table because now illegitimacy can never ever be realized. If your enemy doesn't exist, you win. And so he took that off the table. And what I thought was marvelous is initially, I was on a, a phone call at the White House that day while they were making the announcement, and we were allowed to ask questions. And so I said, well, they didn't announce a date they were going to open the embassy. And I said, well, is there anything that could slow walk this or be a barrier that would stop it? And they said, no, no, no embassy that any president has ever announced has not been built. And I thought, well, but we're talking about Jerusalem here. I, I can certainly, and I know Washington, it could certainly happen. And so after that, Vice President Pence came here and spoke at the Knesset. All the people here on the FRC tour will see the Knesset building. You'll, you'll see their, basically, their counterpart to the Congress. And Vice President Pence on his trip said, well, we'll get it done in 2019. Shortly after that, President Trump announced that on the 70th anniversary, according to the U.S. calendar, 
uh, which is April or May 14th, the United States yeah. is going to open the embassy here in Jerusalem. And I'm going to come back for that. Tony, you may be possibly back here for that. And that will be the greatest event because it will be a shock wave heard all over the Middle East, all over the year, that the U.S. is in business. We recognize this capital and it is never going to be the same again. Illegitimacy will be gone forever as a tool against Israel. Very, very significant. Michelle, not going to stick around. I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to pull the general in here for a moment. I'm going to come back in just a moment. But earlier today, we had a unique privilege of visiting one of the strategic military installations. How significant is the military threat to Israel, and are they prepared? That's what we're going to talk about next with our own Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin. When we return, don't go away. More Washington Watch still to come. Is the, uh, the wind messing up your hair, General? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can count on a Marine to bring comic relief. <laughs> I know, I brought, I brought you. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not going to do this. <laughs> back to Washington Watch. I'm your host, Tony Perkins. Glad you're with us. And we are actually in Israel, overlooking the Sea of Galilee as uh, we do this program tonight. And earlier today, as Israel celebrated its 70th year of independence, a quite significant occurrence. So 70. 70 is a very significant number when you look at uh, numbers in the Bible. Well, we had the uh, the privilege of going on to one of the strategic military installations, uh, receiving a briefing, and then looking at uh, some of their uh, military hardware, and and they had a had the base open to the public uh, for an air show. Uh, but I want to talk now about the significance of the threat to Israel, and are they prepared for what might be ahead? Joining me now is our own Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, retired member of the United States Army after 36 and a half years, a founding member of the Delta Force, a true American hero, one that we're privileged to have a part of our team and on this tour with us. General, welcome back to Washington Watch. Thank you very much. Earlier this week, the Jerusalem Post actually uh, was wrote, wrote a story discussing how uh, because of uh, some of the actions last week in Syria that Iran may be uh, focusing a target directly on Israel possibly from Syrian soil how significant is the threat militarily to Israel here in the Middle East right now yeah it's, uh, it's very significant and, and it has been since uh, the 14th of May 1948 so in that regard, nothing has changed. But uh, Iran is probably the most existential threat to Israel today. And part of that is because we, the United States, in this ill-conceived thing called the Iran deal, have put them on a pathway to a nuclear weapon. Now, many people would look at it and say, well, we live with the Russians, you know, for the, through the Cold War. Yeah, the Russians had no incentive to use a nuclear weapon. The Iranians do, and that's because they're Shia Twelvers, and they believe that creating bloodshed and chaos in the world, particularly in this part of the world, read that as Israel, well, would usher in the reign of their Messiah. So they are an existential threat, but they are also the creators and the supporters of Hezbollah in South Lebanon. And Hezbollah has uh, somewhere between 40 and 60,000 rockets and missiles right now in uh, storage facilities in South Lebanon and uh, they're just waiting for Iran to give them the word. So if Iran's going to do anything, it will probably be through Hezbollah, not maybe in Syria, because there are a lot of Hezbollah in Syria now fighting to prop up Bashar al-Assad, but more likely out of South Lebanon. We know that that uh, Iran, uh, rather Israel, and we're going to look a little bit more at this uh, close, more closely this week, technology is something that they uh, actually are exporting. In fact, we have benefited greatly from their technology, especially on their fighter jets. We've downloaded the real-time information and been able to improve our game as a result. Are, are they prepared for what may come from what Iran might throw at them? 
Yeah, it, and the technology aspect of it is certainly a key component of their readiness. And when I was living over here with the Golani Brigade, uh, we went to the to David Air Base, uh, where you were today, and, and then down to Tel Naf. And long before America was using uh, drones, they were flying those as, in surveillance missions, not only up on the borders, but they were flying them out over the ocean for, for what might be trying to infiltrate. So technologically, they actually have been superior to us in many, many ways. Now that said, uh, yes, they are probably the thing that they do better than anybody in the world is intelligence. And that's and I say that having come out of the intelligence uh, community in my last four years in the military, but the, look, they, this is a matter of survival to them. So they penetrate organizations that we've tried to penetrate, like Hezbollah, like Hamas, uh, like Al Qaeda. They penetrate those organizations because they know how to do it. They know uh, exactly what it takes to get somebody inside, and they have uh, they have a very good intelligence network that is probably the key component to their readiness. In other words, early warning. Now, when we get up uh, up to the Valley of Tears, uh, I, I will you know tell this audience that. The idea that they were surprised in 1973 is is not valid. Uh, they had they knew that something was being planned because of their intelligence, and that goes all the way back to 1973. That's one of their major success stories in uh, readiness. You're listening to Washington Watch. I'm Tony Perkins, joined by Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, retired from the United States Army and the Executive Vice President here at the Family Research Council. One of the dynamics uh, that is at play here when we talk about Iran is that, being that they're the Shiite Muslims, that they have some other enemies besides Israel. I mean, you have Saudi Arabia and other of the surrounding um, Arab countries that are working with Israel in many ways because the common enemy is Iran, and they don't want Iran to dominate this region of the world. No, absolutely not. If uh, as a a now Christian former member of, uh, of Al Qaeda or uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood told me, and you know Kamal Salim, he said if uh, Iran has one bomb and goes to Israel, if they have two, the second one goes to Saudi Arabia. They are sworn enemies, and the Saudis uh, are very, very concerned about what we've done to enable uh, Iran to obtain a nuclear weapon. So, yeah, there's a lot of enmity there, and there's a, there's a, a big problem. With, uh, with that because Saudi Arabia could have a nuclear weapon in probably three days and they would buy it from Pakistan and as they if they continue to see that we're not going to stop Iran from developing a nuclear weapon they're going to get one which will then prompt a, you know the uh, arms race for other countries in this region and the only one that's Shia is really Bahrain and they're about 70 percent Shia but all the rest are Sunnis so you got a Sunni Shia split here, and guess who's getting the nuclear weapons? Except for Pakistan, it's it's Iran. And there's some significant openings uh, with uh, negotiate or with relationships with with Egypt yeah. under uh, President Al Sisi. Um, so there there's some there's some opportunities for peaceful uh, coalition work here in the Middle East. There is absolutely t uh, a lot of opportunity for that. And I look, I think you're going to see more and more. Uh, countries surprising us with the allegiances and the alliances that are going to be formed over the next couple of years. All right, General Jerry Boykin, don't go anywhere. We're going to come back in a little bit with uh, some Q&A with our audience. But when we return after the break, Ken Blackwell joins us to talk about United Nations, friend or foe when it comes to Israel. That's coming up next here on Washington Watch. Don't go away. We're back with more from Israel right after this. <laughs> now we're going to talk about bear wrestling. <laughs> this is Washington Watch. I'm Tony Perkins. Glad you are with us. The website, TonyPerkins.com. If you happen to miss anything on your way home, you got to stop and get a loaf of bread. Uh, Carton of milk, well, you can find it later, all archived at TonyPerkins.com. 
On Twitter, it is at T. Perkins. As I mentioned uh, earlier in the program, we are broadcasting from Israel. In fact, overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Beautiful, beautiful sight. Weather is gorgeous here. And um, we are with 200 of our friends and supporters from across the United States who are here with us this week and next uh, touring the Holy Land. So we're just having a, having a great time already, just getting started. But today was a very significant day, uh, the 70th anniversary of the independence of Israel. And I want to talk now uh, with our, our good friend Ken Blackwell, senior fellow here at the Family Research Council, former mayor of Cincinnati, and also was the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. I want to talk about the United Nations. When it comes to Israel, is the United Nations friend or foe, Ken? It's a combination. Uh, if you look at the United Nations, it came into existence in um, 1945 in San Francisco were 29 nations, but it was heavily influenced in its infancy uh, by the rise of the, the Cold War uh, between the former Soviet Union and the uh, and the United States. Uh, consequently, uh, the United Nations is organized in such a way that a lot of conflicts between the so-called North and the South and the East and the West were played out in, in vote counts. And as a consequence, the Soviet Union organized uh, a lot of uh, uh, nation states that were being led by uh, uh, dictators and, 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 and communists. And as a consequence, uh, there have been votes against Israel that have in fact been motivated, aided and, su and supported uh, by enemies of the United States. Uh, both ideologically, economically, and militarily. And so uh, the United States is on the Security Council. And if you take a look at the recent 43 resolutions that have been um, put out there against Israel, the United Nations has had to use its, its veto power uh, to block. The United States. The United States right. has had to use it to, to block uh, that. The and Nikki Israel. Haley has been very consistent on her support of Israel. Uh, absolutely. Look, it's so that you all understand how this, this is, is organized, when I was serving on the United Nations Human Rights Commission, there were 53 nations. Many of the nations that were uh, on the commission, they were on the jury, but they should have been in the dock. Yeah, and and, as, and as, as a consequence, what, what we witnessed was a lot of uh, log rolling, back slapping, uh, and what I call human rights violators protection programs uh, being put into place. Uh, and, and, and again, the United Nations is a theater, it's a, generally a talk shop, uh, but it is where we play out some of the, the more public discussions and debates that we're having with folks ideologically. Israel has a friend with a lot of influence. It is the United States of America. And I think, I thank God that we finally, after eight years of a president uh, that was going south on Israel, we in fact have a president that is putting together a team that will continue to stand up for Israel. I serve with John Bolton. I serve with John Bolton and we need, we, we need to realize this real uh, clearly. The United Nations, the United States gives the United Nations $8 billion annually. That's a combination of voluntary uh, contributions and mandatory contributions. That accounts for 22% of the United Nations budget. Uh, John Bolton uh, is a person who understands that we should not continue to fund bad behavior because all we're going to get is more bad behavior. Right, yeah. So I am sure that he will be talking to this president saying we have to leverage our influence, we have to exercise our muscle muscle to make sure that they do the right thing. You know, I, I think it's a very interesting point you bring up, Ken, about the previous administration and their lack of support for Israel and how I think that opened the door for the UN to be used as a platform to bludgeon and to beat up on Israel, will we see that decrease now that they know that the United Nation, the United States, is not going to take that at the United I think, Nations? I think we will. The general was was right. If he, he was, was. yeah. <laughs> 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 Even a broken clock is right two times a day. <laughs> <laughs> you say that every 
That was Kim Black on his nice note. That was nice note. <laughs> no, the general is right. Uh, look, if you take a look at what's going on now, the dynamics, you have Russia, a very, uh, it's a def defunct Soviet Union is now Russia, uh, playing footsies with Iran and Syria. Uh, this is about oil, money, it's a, and, it's, and it's about uh, making sure that they continue to play the leverage against the United States interests. The United States knows how to block it. This administration will block it, will push back. The gig is up. All right, you, that's not Star Wars. You know the music you've been on the program enough. That's a break. Folks, we're up against a break. When we come back, we're going to have questions and answers with Michelle Bachman, General Jerry Boykin, and Ambassador Ken Blackwell here on Washington Watch. Don't go away. We're back with more right after this. Welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm your host, Tony Perkins. Glad that you are with us as we're broadcasting live from Israel, celebrating the 70th anniversary of Israel's independence as we uh, tour the Holy Land this week and next. And uh, we, we've been, uh, wind is blowing. We uh, had Michelle Bachman, General Jerry Boykin, Ken Blackwell, we were discussing. Now we're gonna go to questions from uh, the, our friends and supporters that are with us, and, and so we're going to start right now. Sir, your question. Oh. Say, say that again. We lost the first part. Go right ahead. My name is Paul Scott, and I'm from Athens, Alabama, and my question is to Ms. Bachman. Do you see, do you agree with the assessment a lot of Americans have that Congress has become dysfunctional? And if you do agree with that assessment, do you see a way out of that problem? It, it's an easy answer, actually. The answer is 100% yes. I'm extremely disappointed with what I'm seeing in the U.S. Congress because the president came in with a very clear mandate. It was to secure America's borders and make sure that no one coming into the country would pose a, a terrorist threat and repeal Obamacare. Those were very, very clear mandates. And the president was willing to go down that road. But inexplicably, the United States Congress hasn't been willing. They might get their comeuppance this November if it, they don't figure themselves out. And what they need to do is follow what the American people sent them to do. They honestly, this year, they should have no problem getting reelected. They should have no problem. But they turned their back on the agenda that the American people sent them to D.C. to solve. And because of that, they might be given, handed their hat and told to go home. All right, our next question comes from, I can see back there in the back, Bob from South Dakota. Jerry Boykin, question for you. Uh, President Trump is gonna do everything he can to straighten out the Iranian agreement, but it's a bad agreement. Uh, will Israel, they've said that they will not allow Iran to get a nuclear weapon. Are, are they capable of going in alone and taking out the Iranian nuclear program. program. Yeah, Bob, my, uh, that's a great question. And I think that there's been a, uh, obviously a great concern that Israel would uh, do a preemptive strike on the Iranian nuclear program. But this is my assessment. Here's a reality. I'm not sure that even the United States could do it. It's complex. It, first of all, uh, the facilities that they have are, are scattered in a wide, area they're deep underground facilities you could take out some of them but there's no way we could take out the entire thing so to say that we could destroy their nuclear capabilities i think is misleading to say we could set them back uh yes we could set them back the israelis could set them back but keep in mind they've got about three real problems number one their intelligence has to be 100 percent precise if they run a preemptive strike Number two, it's a long ways from Israel. And number three, they're gonna have, the whole world is going to condemn them for doing that. Even though we all know at this point, the Saudis are gonna let them fly their airspace and there's probably gonna be other support in the region as Tony was talking about earlier because the Gulf region wants those weapons preempted. So I think it's a tough target and I'm not sure we could do it, but God be willing, uh, they'll set it back. There's, there's one other problem, if I could add to what the general said, he's exactly right. 
if you recall, after President Obama did the Iran agreement, there also was a sale from Russia to Iran on the S 300s. And this is anti Air, yeah, anti-aircraft missiles, air, air defense. So if you have incoming capability to take out or to bomb these facilities, now we have a layer we didn't have before, and that's the anti-aircraft, blowing planes out of the sky. So it's made innumerably more difficult because of the foolish, tragic choices that were made by President Obama. This is Washington Watch. I'm Tony Perkins, along with uh, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, Ambassador Ken Blackwell, and uh, 200 of our friends and supporters that are with us here in Israel. And our next question. It's Ray from Atlanta. Um, China has the second largest economy in the world. Do you know what role China plays in the, and whether or not they support the existence of Israel? They have not necessarily been a friend of, of, of Israel. Um, let me give you a, an example of what the Trump team brings to the table. Back in 1975, uh, there was a resolution that was passed, Zionism is racism. Um, and it took a lot of work, but in 1991, under John Bolton's leadership, along with Morris Abram, uh, and, and, and others, uh, we put together a team that rolled back, it was a historic move, rolled back that General Assembly uh, resolution uh, by leveraging every bit of influence that we had and we were able to turn some of the major uh, players that had historically been against us like China. So it is about how much influence we are willing to, to leverage. And I think what we saw with the, the Trump administration going toe-to-toe -to -toe with China over trade policy, I, I, I think that, and, and them willing then to come to the table to negotiate, I think that uh, the United States is going to have influence on that. We have another question. Who's next? Go right ahead. Steve from Southern California. The short and long-term uh, situation in Syria uh, that Trump wants to pull off right away to the general or the group, what do you think it should be? General. The uh, issue of Syria, the president making uh, comments a couple of weeks ago that he was thinking about pulling out. What's the long term, the short term there? Yeah, uh, and I said this publicly, so I'm not telling you anything I haven't said on Fox News. I think that was a mistake. I think the president uh, did not think through that one. Uh, and I don't think that there's necessarily a correlation, a direct correlation between that and the use of the chemical weapons. But I think it was a huge mistake, and that is because uh, you don't tell your enemy what your game plan is. And uh, while I would like to get out of Syria and Afghanistan and Iraq, I'd like to get out of all of those. But it's all a matter of time and it has to be done right. And I think that that was a mistake on the president's part. The president has also kind of walked that back since then. I think somebody got to him. But remember what scripture says too. One day, Damascus will be gone in a day according to Isaiah 17. So that is going to happen. What's remarkable is um, there's reports that there's a lot of weaponry that is buried around Damascus, and that may be one potential. So keep your eye on that area. Um, I think we're going to continue to see volatility. There's, it, it's hard to know even who friend and who, who foe is in Syria. But again, you've got to give President Trump the things do. He broke the back of the Islamic State, both in Syria and Iraq. We saw nothing happen for a few years. He's really broken their back, but it's an absolute mess. The biggest calamity is the pers persecution of Christians in that area, and that is ongoing and continuing, and we've never, you know, when you consider Syria's were some of the very first discipleship and where the gospel, uh, some of the first areas where the gospel went, and now Christians are being sent out. So we need to remember persecuted Christians, especially in the Middle East. You're listening to a special edition of Washington Watch. We're broadcasting from Israel, in fact, overlooking the Sea of uh, Galilee. You might be able to hear the wind blowing in the uh, the background as the breeze is coming in off of the, uh, the water. Just a beautiful, beautiful day here in Israel. And our next question comes from whom? All right, see you in the back. Phyllis Scott, Lake Charles, Louisiana. Uh, for uh, Ken, 
uh, I heard you say, if hope this is correct, I'm, I hope it's not actually, <laughs> um, you said eight billion is what the United States gives, part of it's mandatory and part of it is voluntary? Yes. How much is mandatory? That's, that's a good question. I think the overwhelming majority of it is, is, is mandatory because as we found it, there was, we were in on the founding of the United Nations and there was a formula that was mandated. Um, but the eight billion dollars is the eight billion dollars. Because if in fact we want to get out of the mandatory giving, that means that we pull out of the United Nations. I don't think that's going to happen, but when, one of the things that we can uh, depend on is that this president uses bilateral relationships very effectively to influence the behavior of different countries in the multilateral uh, forums like the United Nations and, and other uh, multilateral organizations. Our next question. Yes, sir. My name is Bill Roush from Henderson, Nevada. Just recently we uh, heard that uh, House Speaker Paul Ryan is going to resign. And I don't know who would answer that question best, but I know what impact is this going to have. And uh, I think it's a good thing, and I just want to get your opinion. Well, he is going to retire at the end of his term. So at the end of this year, he is not going to run for re-election, is what he announced. It has set in place uh, kind of a, um, a race for House Speaker. Um, Kevin McCarthy, Steve Scalise, the two front runners. It's been reported in the press that um, that the way is being made for uh, for for Kevin to go forward, but there is some behind the scenes work that still has to be done. He has not been able to put together the requisite number of votes in order the 218 that's required to become speaker. This is yet to be decided. So uh, I can just tell I can't go beyond just saying that what you see in the paper is not always the case. Uh, you may have heard of something like fake news. Um, well, the, the reality is that this this is actually going to play out over the next, um, I would say, probably month, month and a half, maybe two months. So keep your eye on it. It's going to be, a, I think, a very interesting uh, outcome. Our next question. My name is Ron. I'm from Woodenville, Washington, and uh, we understand that President Trump is actually going to meet with uh, Kim from North Korea. It seems like a high-risk adventure to me, uh, and I understand that his Secretary of uh, State has already talked to him. Uh, what is your opinion on this possibility of success with those negotiations? I think that it's tough to have a high rate of success because look at the material that you're working with, the leader of North Korea. You are looking at a certifiable nutcase running that country. And so I don't think that logic is what is going to prevail. And it, it seems like it's ill-advised on my part when I look at it. However, this is extremely serious, what the leader of North Korea is proposing. And don't think that this guy isn't capable of actually trying to bring about his nefarious plan. Uh, North Korea has been called the Walmart of missile production. They make a lot of missiles. Terrorism is really a lot of what their product is. And they sell missiles all over. So they are desirous of having tremendous power. But I think that um, Mike Pompeo is an excellent choice for our Secretary of State. He and I used to sit next to each other on the Intelligence Committee. He's highly capable. And I think the president wants to do something that's a good thing. And I think that he will have good people on our side involved in it. Um, the main thing is that we have to be strong. And President Trump is on uh, an, an effort to make sure that the United States becomes strong again. As you know, for eight years, we saw our military having their legs cut out from under them. We're in a very different place now, but it's always a trajectory. We're on a trajectory down, we're on a trajectory up, but we're not exactly where we should be yet. And, and follow the president's engagement of China, because in the, in the final analysis, China has to be part of the solution. Uh, and he is leveraging trade policy and a whole host of other things. Plus, China holds a lot of our debt. And most people think that that's bad for us. Debt is generally bad. But in fact, we have to progress to pay back that debt. So at the, in, the, in the reality, 
this president is uniquely qualified in position to move China into being part of the solution as a being part of the world. I think we have time for one more question. Rich from Leavenworth, Kansas, for General Boykin. We've heard that the adage that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. In Syria, there's such a cauldron of countries and organizations that it's difficult to determine who really is our friend and our enemy. So given that situation, what do you see as the clearly defined, decisive, and obtainable objective that would be in the best interest of the United States and Israel? There's no good outcome in Syria, uh, period. You've got uh, bad people on both sides. Bashar al-Assad is an evil despot that kills his own people. But the alternative to Bashar al-Assad is al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood and other organizations like that. So which would you rather have? Al-Qaeda, the Muslim Brotherhood, or would you rather have Bashar al-Assad, who's never threatened Israel and never killed Christians? And the other side has done both. Look, there's no good outcome here. I think that uh, <clears throat> what the, the United States needs to be focusing on is building a coalition to actually come up with a transition plan to work out some kind of plan that will be five to ten years in the making, though, to make a peaceful transition to a, a more representative government there. Bashir al-Assad's not going to go quietly. Well, that is all the time we have for this edition of Washington Watch. I want to thank Michelle Bachman, Jerry Boykin, and Ken Blackwell for uh, for joining us. And, of course, I want to thank all of our friends here in Israel who are a part of this COVID-19 tour. And I want to thank you for listening to Washington Watch. Again, if you missed anything, you can check it out at TonyPerkins.com. If you're on Twitter, you can keep up with us this week at T. Perkins. Until next time, I leave you with the encouraging words of the Apostle Paul found in Ephesians. 6, where he says, when you've done everything you can do, when you've prayed, when you've prepared, and when you have taken your stand, by all means, keep standing.